At the beginning of the 20th century, the American industrialist Henry Ford developed a revolutionary way of manufacturing cars. Yet this technique created changes that were not only limited to the increased productivity of the automobile industry. The entirety of 20th century visual and performing arts live in Ford's shadow, being, as they are, a celebration of industrialization, mechanization, and the mass production that Ford helped pioneer. Throughout the course of this programme, we shall be tracing how 20th century art has moved from what the philosopher Walter Benjamin famously described as art in the age of mechanical reproduction, to the world which we live in now, a world of mechanical reproduction in the age of art. Key to understanding the art of the 20th century is an understanding of Fordism, a term used to categorise the revolutionary working practices instituted by the automobile manufacturer Henry Ford. Yet Fordism was a term coined not by the American industrial complex which spawned it, but by the Italian Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci, in the notebooks he wrote in prison between 1929 and 1935. Gramsci used the term to describe a method of production pioneered in Ford's automobile factories in the early 1910s. This process was based around three simple principles designed to increase the speed of the production process by eliminating surplus movement and skill. The principles of assembly are these. Place the tools and the men in the sequence of the operation so that each component part shall travel the least possible distance while in the process of finishing. Number two, use work slides or some other form of carrier so that when a workman completes his operation, he drops the part always in the same place, which place must always be the most convenient place to his hand and if possible have gravity carry the part to the next workman for his operation. Number three, Use sliding assembly lines by which the parts to be assembled are delivered at convenient distances. This assembly line technique was also combined with an atomization of the process of construction. For example, in Ford's factories, the construction of a car's flywheel magneto, a job previously done by one workman, was broken down into 29 separate operations each done by a different employee. This cut the time of construction from 20 minutes to 13 minutes and 10 seconds. When Ford then raised the assembly line of this object to waist height in order to reduce surplus movement, the time taken to construct the magneto dropped to only seven minutes. When this assembly line technique of constructing cars was first implemented in Ford's factories in 1913 and 1914, they saw rapid increases in productivity. In the assembly of the car's chassis, the combination of moving assembly line, the subdivision of labour and the innovative raising of the assembly line to waist height reduced the construction time from 12 hours and 28 minutes per chassis to only one hour, 33 minutes. Gramsci saw, in the methodology of the Fordist production line, the physical embodiment of the ideas of the American cybernetics pioneer, Frederick Taylor. Taylor, too, had a great interest in industry and factories. In his book, the principles of scientific management, he analysed human labour as a mechanical process 
in an attempt to increase efficiency. Taylor posited that motion studies, work fragmentation and scientific principles could be used to develop universal methods of working that could be taught to and applied by everybody. Like Ford, he saw efficiency as being gained through a clearer division of labour between management, who do the thinking, and the workers, who do the physical labour. The first illustration is that of handling pig iron. And this work is chosen because it is typical of perhaps the crudest and most elementary form of labour which is performed by man. This work is done by men with no other implements than their hands. The pig iron handler stoops down, picks up a pig weighing about 92 pounds, walks for a few feet or yards, and then drops it on the ground or upon a pile. This work is so crude and elementary in its nature that the writer firmly believes that it would be possible to train an intelligent gorilla so as to become a more efficient pig iron handler than any man can be. Yet it will be shown that the science of handling pig iron is so great and amounts to so much that it is impossible for the man who is best suited to this type of work to understand the principles of this science or even to work in accordance with these principles without the aid of a man better educated than he is. These words very much echo Ford's thoughts when he wrote, I heard it said, in fact I believe it's quite a current thought, that we have taken skill out of work. We have not. We have put in skill. We have put a higher skill into planning, management, and tool building, and the results of that skill are enjoyed by the man who is not skilled. Yet, it was Gramsci who best understood the aesthetic nature of this redistribution of skill in the workplace. Tayloris, supposedly, produce a gap between manual labour and the human content of work. On this subject, some useful observations can be made on the basis of past history and specifically of those professions forth of as amongst the most intellectual, that is to say the professions connected with the reproduction of texts for publication or other forms of diffusion and transmission. If one thinks about it, it is clear that in these trades the process of adaptation to mechanization is more difficult than elsewhere. Why? Because it is so hard to reach the aid of professional qualification when this requires of the worker that he should forget or not think about the intellectual content of the text he is reproducing. The worker's interest in the intellectual content of the text can be measured from his mistakes. In other words, it is a professional failing. This deconstruction of an object into individual parts, so important for the Fordist assembly line production technique and Tayloristic thinking, can be seen mirrored in much of the abstract art of the early 20th century. From the disassembly of visual stimuli into simple shapes and single colours, as seen in the work of the Russian suprematist painter Kasimir Malevich, to the work of photographer Edward Mybridge, whose dissections of movement inspired the paintings of the Italian futurists. The Italian futurists, who propagated in the first few decades of the 20th century, provide an apt example of the influence of industry on the arts. Their main spokesperson, the poet Joseph Marinetti, spoke of burning down libraries and flooding the museums and living in the now, the age of the machine. We declare that the splendour of the world has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing automobile with its bonnet adorned with grey tubes like serpents with explosive breath. 
a roaring motor car which seems to run on machine gun fire is more beautiful than the victory of Samotras. Marinetti's compatriot and fellow futurist, the composer and painter Luigi Rossolo, had a similarly forward-thinking and industrially influenced aesthetic. In his 1913 book, The Art of Noises, Rossolo calls for the integration of industrial sounds into the musical lexicon. This revolution of music is paralleled by the increasing proliferation of machinery sharing in human labour. In the pounding atmosphere of great cities as well as in the formerly silent countryside, machines create today such a large number of varied noises that pure sound, with its littleness and its monotony, now fails to arouse any emotion. We must replace the limited variety of timbres of orchestral instruments by the infinity variety of timbres of noises obtained through spatial mechanisms. Rossolo would later put the theory into practice by composing pieces which included factory bells and ship's whistles, as well as creating a set of musical instruments he referred to as intonomori, instruments designed to recreate the scratching scraping and mechanical sounds of industry. Yet, although nearly all of these instruments were destroyed in the bombings of the wars that followed, and only a handful of recordings of them survive, the book that he wrote has had an enduring influence upon the artwork of the 20th century. It was through Rossolo's appreciation of the beauty of industrialization, mechanization, and mass production that the sound palette of 20th century music was opened up. The incorporation of noise seen in the work of later composers like Edgar Varese or John Cage came directly from Rossolo, who saw beauty not in the outdated romantic ideals of nature, but in the heat, chaos and sweat of the factory. Rossolo was also a painter and it is clear from his canvases that he saw great parallels between art and industry. This can be seen in the aesthetic similarities between the ways in which he presents both musicians and factory workers. Despite being adept at both music and painting, he never used both in the same work, and the world had to wait until 1924 to see the first multimedia celebration of industry. The paintings of Fernand Leger often celebrate industrial forms, depicting mechanisms and people alike under the same plastic conventions, that of industrial finishings and mechanical assemblages. Simplified to the essential, inspired by factory products, geometric and brightly coloured, man and machine alike are reaching for the sky. Pipes, tubes and revolutionary engineering fuse in building the cathedral of the early 20th century. In Woman with a Book, painted in around 1923, we can notice the clear-cut stylization of forms, the shades of grey, the polished aluminium-like texture, the flowers closely resembling power plugs. Organic forms are rationalised into a promise of new life, a quasi-mechanical one. Leger confesses where his deep fascination for mechanical power came from. I was stunned by the sight of the breach of a 75mm in the sunlight. It was the magic of light on the white metal. That's all it took for me to forget the abstract art of 1912 to 1913. In 1924, Leger teamed up with the composer George Antile and the filmmakers Dudley Murphy and Man Ray to create the film Ballet Mécanique. Ballet Mécanique was a glorification of industry in the futurist mould. Antile's score called not only for player pianos, but for sirens and propellers. 
Yet it wasn't only in Europe where the beauty of the factory was appreciated. Futurism had taken hold in Russia too, and the composer Alexander Mosolov created a ballet whose striking first movement used the factory as its subject. Iron Foundry, from 1927. and sound of the factory inspired many 20th century artists, especially the futurists. Yet other contemporaneous artists wanted to see the factory not as an aspic sealed aesthetic object whose goods could be plundered at will, but instead as the site for new psychological, social and economic formations. The Russian theatre director, Zephylod Meyerhold, combined the work of Frederick Taylor with that of the behavioural scientist Ivan Pavlov to create a new kind of theatre. Meyerhold's theatre is one of Pavlovian reflexes in which the actor becomes the Taylorist untrained gorilla. Yet Pavlov and Taylor were not the only theorists whose work helped unpack the psychology of those on the production line. The publishing and dispersal of Sigmund Freud's writings at the beginning of the 20th century had an important impact on artistic creation. Whereas Pavlov's behavioural studies, and later those of B.F. Skinner, had transformed the view of the human body into that of a machine, Freud's work did that, but for the human mind. This view of human as automata greatly influenced the surrealist art movement. Through the use of automatic writing and drawing in which the unconscious takes over completely, the surrealists used their minds as a machine to produce artwork unlike any seen before. We must give thanks to Freud for his discoveries. On the basis of his research, a current of opinion is at last flowing by means of which the explorer of humanity will be able to push his investigations much further, authorised as he will be to take account of more than merely superficial realities. André Breton provided the first definition of surrealism in the Surrealist Manifesto of 1927. Here we can see the centrality of the idea of human as automata to surrealist thinking. Surrealism. Pure psychic automatism by means of which one intends to express, either verbally or in writing, or in any other manner, the actual functioning of thought. Dictated by thought, in the absence of any control exercised by reason, free of any aesthetic or moral concern. The body as a factory, or the body as machine was an idea that was later echoed in the body art movement, which started in the 1960s. Here, the human body became the theatre for action, and often the artwork itself. Sometimes, the emphasis lay tacitly on its mechanical functions and limitations, such as in Chris Burden's endurance performances. Sometimes, the body underwent changes of boundaries and physical perception, such as in Hermann Nietzsche's ritualistic works. Other times, it may be more explicitly problematized as a mechanical device, such as in Sterlach's Muscle Machine. Even though the artworks that we have looked at so far clearly draw on Fordism and reflect back the mechanical worlds opened up by Ford's techniques, none are essentially Fordist. What is produced is not mass-produced, and the factory is still only one person. Giuseppe Pino Galizio and Jean Tongli were two artists who created machines to replicate abstract expressionist paintings. Pino Galizio, a situationist, sought to devalue abstract expressionism by flooding the market with Pollock-esque storbs in an attempt to devalue the style. However, Pino Galizio's lasting contribution to culture 
is not to be found on the walls of MoMA or the Tate, but here in the Chinese Import and Export Fair. Here, buyers from Europe and America come to bulk order cheaply made yet high quality works created in factories filled with Chinese artists, many of them recent art school graduates, simply copying designs given to them by their employer. A recent New York Times article described one Chinese painting entrepreneur as running a factory in which 10 designers did original paintings which were then copied en masse by 300 others and framed by 200 more. The paintings produced are in any style that sells. Theoretically, these Chinese paintings should be saturating the American and European art markets, driving down prices. Yet Pollock's work sells for as much as ever. A testament, perhaps, both to the idiosyncrasies of the art market, which behaves like no other, and to capitalism's merciless detonement of situationist aesthetics. Jean Tongli's abstract expressionist machines later ridded themselves of the veiled critiques of that artistic movement and became autonomous kinetic sculptures in their own right, following the example of inventor, engineer and cartoonist Rube Goldberg, whose machines preceded Tongli's by over a decade. Self-reflexive and autonomous, often sketched up in comic strip panels, Goldberg's machines would execute a simple task with the help of an extremely elaborated set of operations. By following Goldberg's lead, Tongli gave his work over to being a pure celebration of the machine, rather than a satirical sideswipe at an already waning art movement. A fashion in the late 20th century that moves parallel with the move away from first world factory production and increasing globalization is the outsourcing of labour. Andy Warhol's setting up of a factory in 1962 was very much behind the times, as well as producing considerably less work than its name suggests. By this point, the composer John Cage had already started using other people as outsourced labour to complete his pieces. Cage's score for Variations 1 from 1958 consists of a series of transparent acetates containing grids, points and lines, which the performer must lay over each other to create the piece. Here, it is the outsourcing of labour to the performer that frees the composer from compositional labour, as the performer must essentially complete the piece for them. A more extreme version of this outsourcing can be seen in the work Plus Minus by the composer Karlheinz Stockhausen. In this work, the kit for constructing the piece must be fully notated by the performer, who has been outsourced the translation of formal compositional procedures into conventional musical notation, an operation which Stockhausen, or his assistant, would have previously performed. Sol Lewitt wrote instructions and certificates that would allow his wall drawings to be executed by external parties without his direct intervention. Art galleries and museums would commission skilled workers to execute the piece, allowing an otherwise fixed work to be portable and selectively distributed whilst its content remains unaltered. Whilst outsourcing was not Ford's idea and did not become conventional business practice until well after his death, at its heart is an essentially Fordist concept. That of the division between management and labour and the redistribution of skill that this entails. In the works we have just looked at, the author takes on a management role which carefully controls the reallocation of labour. This means that whilst these works aren't essentially Fordist, they have built into their DNA the ideologies that Ford helped pioneer at the start of the century. One of Henry Ford's greatest achievements was the popularisation of the barbecue. 
In the production process of his cars, Ford found that there were wood scraps and bits of sawdust left over as a waste product of the production process. In order to increase profit, Ford transformed these scraps of wood into charcoal briquettes, simultaneously creating an artificial demand for them by popularizing the barbecue. It is this ingenious transformation of waste product into commodity, which is inherent and key idea in Fordist thinking. Many of the works that we have discussed so far have large amounts of waste. Not in the form of physical byproducts of the artistic process, but in the invisible, uncommodified labour that go into their production. This waste is hidden labour. In all of these cases, the hidden labour could be turned productive by transforming it into a performance which can be commodified. Performance arts and relational aesthetics are two of the few fields in which this externalised labour is made profitable. The work of Santiago Sierra is a fantastic example of Fordist ingenuity at work. Sierra's work is a clear extension and elaboration of the hidden labour that was always built into the system of artistic production from Duchamp's ready-mades onwards. Concerned with the issues of labour and wages within capitalist regimes, Sierra often works with people left at the periphery of politics, such as ethnic groups or politically or socially disadvantaged minorities, hiring them to perform menial tasks, usually in art shows, galleries and museum settings. By redistributing invested capital and making this process public as part of his practice, the vast majority of the labour remains visible and he is able to achieve an admirable level of parsimony. Similarly, in the work Faith Moves Mountains, the Belgian artist Francis Alice asks 500 volunteers to move sand from one side of a dune to the other using shovels. The work is recorded on video and later a making of film is presented in which parts of the production process are also revealed. Thus, most of the artistic labour behind the piece is either externalised or visible. However, these pieces of Sierra and Elise are not mass-produced and so not truly Fordist. It seems nearly a century after Ford's momentous breakthroughs in production technology that we are yet to see a true Fordist art, one which celebrates industry, is mass-produced and externalises its labour. In 2012, the writer and theorist Frederick Drop proposed a striking addendum to the previous century's inability to grasp the profundity of Ford's vision. In The New Fordist Manifesto, Drop engages in a radical rereading of Gramsci that seeks to position Fordism as a viable aesthetic agenda, not only in order to open up new vistas of artistic expression, but also in order to combat the performing arts' increasing decline in income, known to economists as Beaumont's cost disease. Cost disease was first proposed by the economists William J. Beaumont and William G. Bowen in their 1966 book, Performing Arts, The Economic Dilemma. Their contention was that, due to the interlinked nature of the labour markets, an increase in wages in one industry will cause corresponding increases in that of another. Thus, an increase in wages in the industrial sector will precipitate increased wages in the performing arts. However, whilst increased wages in industry are tied with an increase in productivity, or output per work hour, there is a physical limit to the increase of productivity possible in the performing arts. While in industry, this productivity may come through improvements in technology or production techniques, requiring less people and taking less time to produce an object. It still takes the same amount of time and people to play a Beethoven string quartet as when it was first written nearly 200 years ago. To play the quartet in more time or with less people is not possible, thus a real increase in productivity is prevented, meaning that, year on year, the performing arts will, in real terms, lose money. However, Drop contests this notion. 
the increase in productivity discussed by Beaumont and Bowen is only related to visible, not invisible, labour. He contended that, through adopting Fordist production techniques, this invisible labour can be externalised, commodified and made profitable. Shortly after the publication of Drop's article, the new Fordist organisation was set up, dedicated to putting his ideas into practice. But not everyone was impressed. The cultural theorist Peter Zak launched a blistering broadside against New Fordism, describing it as the cynical, intellectually bereft attention-seeking of the worst type of immoral, money-fixated charlatans, a movement which seeks to degrade modern art through commodification, a new, dark, right wing of aesthetics. Drop reposted with an article entitled Manufacturing Style, in which he not only laid the aesthetic groundwork for New Fordism, but proposed it as the only real way for decommodifying art. Drop contested that, whilst in industry, a consistent deviation in reproduction of an object represented a failure in production and a loss in productivity, in aesthetic terms, this consistent deviation was style and that, using behaviourist, Pavlovian and Tayloristic techniques to control this deviation, an aesthetically coherent and new style could be produced. He also contested that, in the age of intense economic commodification in the art markets, New Fordism with its ideology of mass production, detached and ambivalent to market concerns of supply and demand, was a way to articulate old, leftist, Adornian ideas about the autonomy and decommodification of art. Our new vision of Fordism is not based on the utilization of tools to improve artistic productivity, but to aestheticize the process of productivity and create an art so detached and unconcerned with any type of idea of supply and demand that it achieves cultural autonomy. Hello, I'm here at the uh, performance of the new Fordist organisation. Here we can see some of the prototypes of the technologies that can be used for the mass production art. Over here we can see a use of new Fordist painting. <laughs> Over there a computer breaks down any image into individual brush strokes, which is then projected one at a time onto the canvas. All the artist has to do is to simply paint over where the computer shows the brush strokes. Here we can also see a great example of the outsourcing of labour, as one of the audience members has been used to see artists. Over in the corner, there is a new way of playing the keyboard in which any piece of music stored as a MIDI file can be broken down into individual notes, which are then transformed into lights, which flash onto the keyboard wherever the player must play. Again, a great example of externalisation as audience members were also used here. And over here is a computer which can create orchestra pieces in just over the time it takes to listen to it. In the course of this performance, <laughs> an entire orchestra piece has already been created and is being printed out as we speak. <laughs> Using a simple controller, parameters such as rhythm, pitch, or the instrument playing can be controlled, and the computer produces a synthesized version of the piece. It is then simultaneously rendered into musical notation and printed out. It is here that we see the final articulation of the Fordist dream. The atomization of the process of labour, the de-skilling of the performer, and the externalization of hidden labour into performance. Art's obsession with mechanization, industrialization, and mass production here finds its ideal form. 20th century art struggled to live up to the revolutionary changes in production which Henry Ford pioneered at its start. Whilst art has undoubtedly been existing in a time of mechanical reproduction, a time fated and lionised, the world is much different now from when Walter Benjamin wrote those insightful words. Now we live in a world in which the commodification of art has reached a dreadful apex, an age of art where the super-rich have destroyed any semblance of a work's real value through super-inflated prices, creating a cultural subprime bubble which will undoubtedly soon burst. 
We live in this age of art. And it seems the only way of establishing a real value in a market so perverse is to display absolute ambivalence to it. To create art at a rate far higher than any reasonable adherence to the laws of supply and demand would suggest. In other words, it seems that art's liberation from the market is now not through an investment in Benjamin's flawed concept of the aura, but through the thing which nullifies the aura itself, through mass production. <laughs>